I'm Marcus Smith, and this is Constant Wonder. Join me on a quest to find awe and wonder in all nature, human or wild, vast or small, encounters that move us beyond words. It is so common for us to close our eyes and picture blowing sand dunes and a lack of plants or any kinds of organisms except maybe a camel. We have these misconceptions about them as lifeless or stagnant, desert wasteland or desertification. These are negative words when in reality we have these deserts that are really cool, really diverse, teeming with life. I want you to meet Dr. Sasha Reed, one of those fortunate souls who gets to live a stone's throw away from some of America's most iconic, picturesque public lands, including that mighty tourist magnet called Arches National Park. Sasha Reed is a biogeochemist with the U.S. Geological Survey in Moab, Utah. This part of the world is a place where, as the celebrated writer Wallace Stegner once put it, you have to get used to an inhuman scale. He's right, of course. But even at that, maybe he's pulling his punches because the sheer vastness of the Colorado Plateau and surrounding deserts can overpower any attempt to comprehend it. It feels like another planet if you can picture the kind of skyscrapers of red rock above you and the sun shining and the sage greens of shrubs and the bright greens of the grasses and you have the Colorado River muddy running through the middle of it. And so you're surrounded by these big things that draw your eye and that are impressive. These big arches, these big cliff faces, this big sky. Like Wallace Stegner or anybody else who's been there, Sasha Reed has dealt with the shocking immensity of this place. She loves the massive natural monuments, that inhuman scale. Her deeper passion, however, seems to move in the opposite direction. Her gaze is routinely directed at thriving communities of minuscule organisms that you or I might not ever notice unless somebody points them out for us. And then all of a sudden, something, maybe a lizard moves or something and catches your eye on the ground. And then you look down and at first it looks like some weird dirt. And then if you get down and look closely, it is this universe apart. This universe she's talking about, these communities of biocrust, immense in their own way, each is a micro-complex. I'm not so sure the term biocrust is a real winner. I, I can't imagine any PR firm suggesting that you brand these organic colonies as cryptobiotic or microphytic soils. Great terms for scientists, but kind of challenging for layfolk. Yet if anyone can say biocrust and get you watering at the mouth, craving an encounter with it, well, Sasha Reed can. In this episode of Constant Wonder, two remarkable characters. First, Sasha Reed herself, whom you've just met, one of the best science educators you'll ever meet, who grew up back east, initially thought she'd become a doctor or a lawyer, who had never been camping until she was an adult, and who openly admits to having been scared the first time she found herself out under a desert night sky with nothing but a backpack. Nowadays, Sasha has learned how to live out of a backpack, and she loves dirt, biocrust in particular. And she wants you and me to love it too. She's kind of a biocrust missionary. And when she's out in the backcountry, she often ends up tucking specimens of this very special soil into her backpack to put under a microscope back at the lab. Quick aside here if you happen to see your toddler putting dirt clods in your backpack, Think of Dr. Sasha Reed and let it go, because maybe that child's a budding biogeochemist. Then, once we've gotten to know Sasha Reed and how she managed some real tension between her hopes and her fears, we'll also get to know the second love of her life, after her husband, of course. I'm referring to this episode's second remarkable character, 
A little personification will be needed here because I'm talking about the unusually charismatic Biocrest itself. Something very charming about Sasha Reed is that she is also charmed by this tiny little world of organisms that she studies. I have heard her personify them, speaking with genuine enthusiasm about their beauty, their moxie, their patience, their indomitable spirit. These friends of hers in Biocrust, minuscule as they are, well, they've just started to remind me an awful lot of the Who's down in Whoville from Horton Hears a Who. That's a quick hat tip to Dr. Seuss and his ethical and environmental concern for small living things. That's a perspective that resonates in a big way with our guest, and I think that's hardly a spoiler at this point. So let's begin with the story of our first character, the biogeochemist Dr. Reed. A moment ago she said, and then you look down. I think she was being autobiographical there about the moment that her thinking transformed back in the days when she first made acquaintance with our second character, Biological Soil Crust. It is this highly textured, multicolored community of mosses and lichens and cyanobacteria living and photosynthesizing right there on the soil surface. And it looks so weird that it it stops you in your tracks if, if you really get down and look at it. And so I remember thinking, what the heck is this? I have to ask if there wasn't a conversion of some kind for you in all of this, because I happen to know that you didn't go camping as a kid, <laughs> and you'd never been camping till you came out west. Where did you first go camping, and did you, on that occasion, have any understanding of just how rich and abundant the life forms are in a place like the Intermountain Desert West? The first place I went camping was outside of Phoenix, so it was a desert. I had not been camping before. I was terrified about the idea of sleeping with only a thin piece of fabric between me and all of the things that certainly wanted to kill me in the desert night, all the sounds and the small chirps and the creaks. Was there um, elbow twisting involved to get you there? There, So I was going to, to visit my boyfriend, uh, now my husband, and he is an avid camper. And I hadn't agreed to go camping. <laughs> he was going to college out west. I was in college in New York. And I came out to visit him, and he picked me up at the Phoenix airport. And he let me know then that we were going camping. And it was in a desert. And I was really nervous, but probably trying to play it pretty cool. And, and then the stars came out, and they were bright. Uh, the sky, not having very much moisture, really <laughs> let me see uh, a whole new side of, of the stars. And, and sitting outside and feeling the air as it cooled and hearing the sounds of the animals as they called to each other. So I went to college thinking I would be a lawyer, and then I switched to thinking I would be a medical doctor, and that's why I took organic chemistry and absolutely fell in love with organic chemistry in large part because of an incredible professor. And I remember driving one night with my college friends, and we were going to visit some other friends at a different town, and looking up and seeing the bright night sky and seeing molecules in the stars. So one of the ways that we draw molecules in chemistry is kind of letters that connect with lines, and they really look like constellations in some way. And, and that hit me like a ton of bricks at that moment. I was seeing the molecules that I had been drawing in class in the stars and feeling that scale of the molecular to the universal and feeling like this small part of this bigger thing and smaller thing. And so it was that crossing from the things that I couldn't see because they were so small to the things that I couldn't see because they were so vast felt really, really powerful in the moment. You're reminding me of being a young scout in the bottom of the Grand Canyon 
where just a day before I had been on the rim looking at the vastness mm-hmm. of it, but then I'm down at the river looking just at a few pebbles. Yes. And realizing that somehow these things adhere to each other, the big and the small. I love that. And I think that connectedness, that big and the small, not only are they both existing, but what you were experiencing too, the pebbles came from the rock. And so that connection between things and just feeling like this bit of stardust ourselves in those moments was really, really powerful. And most of my friends were like, why are you studying (laughs) chemistry? To have that be providing these kind of profound experiences in the universe um, was really, really cool. Did you feel a little like the odd person out, you know, the odd man out? I don't think any of my closest friends were doing any kind of science degree at all. And like I said, my, there are no scientists in my family. Was that hard to be kind of on your own that way? It wasn't. I kind of liked it, I think. I, I kind of enjoyed the challenge of taking what I was learning and forcing my friends and family to be excited about it. (laughs) And I think that I never realized that before until that question, but I think that still plays out now to, to take things that it is easy for people not to see the beauty of or the wonder of and to try to find the ways to share it with them so that it hits them like a ton of bricks. So I loved chemistry and graduated in chemistry, but when I was leaving college, I didn't feel that I wanted to go on with a career in chemistry, and I think it was because I didn't feel very connected to the work that I was doing. I loved intellectually how it let me see the world, and it seemed very exciting in some ways, but I really knew it wasn't for me, and I kind of thought I was done with science after that. And I moved out west to be near my then boyfriend, now husband. And it was through that experience out west where I really started to miss science, kind of like the mafia, you know, you never get out. (laughs) Um, They pull you back in. And so I was a technician working with the U.S. Geological Survey missing science. So got that job doing science. And I was introduced to some scientists who were biogeochemists. And I was trying to figure out what exactly that field was. And it's a younger field. They didn't have it at my college at all. And I realized that it was the study of the natural world using chemistry as a central toolkit and that it would allow me to join my love of chemistry with my desire to work on global ecological issues. And it blew my mind. The idea that chemistry could be used in that way to solve problems. You know how people say it blew my mind. Okay, you just told me a story about the connection between the stars and then the schematic drawings of molecules. Mm -hmm. And that's mind-blowing. But you actually had your mind blown just by starting to understand what a biogeochemist might be? Yeah, exactly. And not only to understand what a biogeochemist might be, but to see that that's what I wanted to be. To see that there was actually this field, this study type in the world that exactly fit my loves. So tell me again exactly how it fit your loves. Yeah, I want this planet to be able to sustain us and these incredible ecosystems of other kinds of organisms, this kind of joining of the living and the non-living. And especially at that age, in your early 20s, I really wanted to do the kind of science that would help us have the information we need to make wonderful decisions about this planet. And I felt like the organic chemistry that I was doing in college was super cool and was of interest, but it didn't have any of that aspect of the challenges that I think that we face as a species here. I felt that in order to address those, I would have to leave chemistry behind. You suddenly realized, I don't have to leave that behind. I can I can still have my cake and eat it too. I can be the chemist that I want to be, but I can use that chemistry to address these challenges that I think are most pressing for us. 
Our guest here on Constant Wonder is Sasha Reed. Dr. Reed is a biogeochemist with the U.S. Geological Survey, a woman who once thought she was done with chemistry, only to find out that chemistry wasn't quite done with her. This recognition was a turning point in her life, ultimately leading to a doctorate from the University of Colorado at Boulder. But that might actually be jumping too far ahead of where we are in this story. We're still in Moab in a season when she was still trying to find her vocation in life. Her boyfriend and she are now married. The desert wasn't losing its charm at all. If anything, its spell was growing stronger for them. And this region, where a whole lot of people would gladly live if only they could, was beginning to feel more and more like home. She was willing to serve tables to stay put right there. I'm kind of tempted to think of her as kind of like, well, you know, one of those aspiring actresses in Hollywood or a performer going to New York City, just with a very different sort of ambition, way out in the thirstiest miles of flyover country. So we moved to a dryland place, not because I had a job studying biocrusts. When we first moved to Moab in the late 90s, I was waiting tables at the Moab Brewery and the coffee shop there. And so I was just exploring the out of doors on my own and didn't have any kind of formal introduction to biocrusts. The first biocrusts I saw were incredibly colorful. And so I think I, I had the opportunity to be shocked by them early on because there were so many pinks and greens and blacks and what, what whites. What were you expecting? I think I didn't even know they existed. It would be highly impolitic of me here to say that she stumbled on biocrusts because once you know how fragile and vulnerable they are— you would be super careful not to stumble. The scientists and conservationists and rangers all advocate for their protection. It's not enough to just tread lightly. A person's a person, no matter how small. But as I was saying, Sasha Reed had an accidental encounter with these living organisms, discovering them quite by chance, and she was immediately hooked. Her fears as an East Coast girl out West, intimidated by desert wildness and solitude and vastness, those are in her rearview mirror. Red Rock Country ended up fitting her much better than she ever could have anticipated. There's a pivotal memory she has, kind of her baptism by sand, you could say. It's the moment she realized not only that she loved her new life in Western dry lands, but that she had what it takes to thrive there. I was doing research as a technician with the U.S. Geological Survey, and I had to hike in and out of an area where I was going to collect some samples of soil and biocrust. Yeah. And many miles. I'm, I'm trying to remember if it was something on the order of an 18-mile day. And, and I started early in the morning when it was just getting light, and I ended in the dark. I had to uh, hike with my, my headlamp a little bit. And I think that experience of overcoming my fear to be able to spend time outside by myself was transformative I had this heavy backpack on filled with soils. I had made it all the way there, done my collections by myself, was walking back, beautiful canyons, incredible vistas around me. I am carrying this heavy pack. I've covered all of these miles. I'm going to make it back by myself. Uh, I can handle this in a way that surprised me. And, and that shaped me somehow, and I felt so capable. You're a novice sent to do field work to collect specimens for the lab. You're all alone for miles on end, from dawn till dusk. It's not suitable work for just anyone, particularly if you're not comfortable being alone with your own thoughts. There are TV survival shows about all of this, you know. I learned from Sasha Reed how the experience was not distressing or demoralizing for her. Quite the opposite, in fact. I, I think this comes from how 
the West and my time outside has shaped me, but I, I feel drawn to open spaces that I can see a lot of nature around me. And I think I really like to feel small. I think life can be overwhelming for all of us at times and, and we can feel intensely the stresses of our day-to-day -day life and, and the challenges that we face and things we have to deal with. Feeling small somehow makes those stresses feel less important to me. They're kind of seen in the context of a much larger world and it makes me be like, all right, like, that's not that big a deal. I can, I can handle that. It seems like from studying myself, I also am drawn to making myself a little bit afraid. <laughs> really? Yeah. I mean, you can make light of that and laugh all you want, but you're seriously, I seriously you benefit from putting yourself in situations where there's a little bit of fear that I, kicks in. I seem drawn to it. Yes. Like I like to go to pretty remote places and to kind of push myself to experience adventures that in the moment I wonder what it is that I'm doing. So not not adrenaline type adventures like jumping off of something or something like that, but more going to the middle of nowhere and trying to be out there with a handful of friends for a long time, maybe hiking a lot of miles, maybe climbing a mountain, doing something where the remoteness and the kind of scope of the trip make me feel a little bit nervous. I don't know if that's because I enjoy the release of surviving when we get back or, or if it's similarly to the feeling small, it helps me put in perspective there are things to be worried about and you don't need to worry about this work thing. But I, I find myself a lot wondering, what am I doing right now? Why am I doing this? But I, I seem to keep doing it. Is there a way to bridge from that experience of awe that comes from fear to doing the thing you said earlier on you want to do in the world, have impact that benefits and, and brings hope to people? Maybe part of what I enjoy about experiences where I have fear is seeing myself move through the fear, take action and do what needs to be done, even in the face of being afraid. And I think that's what hope is, that even though we're not sure of the outcome and we're worried about the scale of the challenge, that we're able to take action and move forward, even if we're afraid. And, and so maybe that is what builds hope in me, is the confidence that I can move forward, even when I'm afraid, even when things seem hard. And that's the hope that I want to share with other people so that we together can move forward, even, even if things are challenging in the moment. The last time that played out for you with hope at the end, was it camping? <laughs> when I felt hopeful at the end and I made it through, yeah. Where were you? I was the last time that I, I really felt pushed. I was in southwestern Colorado on a long trip. The weather had been challenging. We were at very high elevation, but I was with people who helped me laugh and pushed me through. And at the end, we were really glad that we did it. My boy and I, we went hiking uh, a while back. It was the last time we could access the high mountains back here before a storm came in. And the storm came in while we were there, so we were trying to get out. And he's 14 years old. He thought we were going to die. Yeah. And so tell me how that played out. I told him that we were not going to die. <laughs> and I wasn't sure that we would survive. <laughs> But we got back to the car, we were drenched and cold, and I was not near hypothermia, but I thought I could be there in five minutes. I'm a timid soul. Mm -hmm. I don't really, I'm not a thrill seeker. Mm -hmm. I want to be safe. I want to live. And yet in, the, in my memory, it was a good experience. Yeah. So that's what I, I find really interesting. Is there, for you, when you think of it as a good situation and Remembrance, is it because you lived? Is it because you have the ability to overcome? I think it is for me, number one, that I survived. Mm -hmm. 
And that shows a kind of capability, but that capability I know was conjoint with foolishness. And so I have a certain element of shame. And I remember once becoming so dehydrated out in the slick (laughs) rock above Moab Mm -hmm. on a bicycle where I didn't have enough water for the trip. Mm -hmm. And my tongue was sticking to the roof of my mouth. Mm -hmm. And I felt so foolish. I, so I had to drink cooler water out of my car once because I was so dehydrated and just bare, I had tried to break into another car where I saw a water bottle. And I think I think I, I know that feeling. I know exactly what you mean, but I don't want to be at the end of my life and not have had those experiences where I got pushed. I pushed myself and some of it was my own, you know, decision making and, and things that I wouldn't do again in retrospect, but that that you just feel alive, I think, both because you survived, you're not dead, but also because you were faced with a set of problems that had an uncertain outcome and you made it. I know what you're talking about. I do know what you're (laughs) talking about. I I was not an active outdoors person Mm -hmm. until I was in my late 20s. Mm -hmm. And when I realized I can actually climb a big mountain and... I might be in pain at the end of the trip, Mm -hmm. 16 hours later, Mm -hmm. 20 miles, (laughs) vertical elevation, gain of a mile. You you, you say, this is life. Yeah. This is life. There's something powerful about that. It sets up some sort of little conduit system in your, like, you've got this. And I think that ends up playing out in our regular lives, yes. too, in ways that are, that, you know, self-confidence isn't the right word, but like, I can, I can do this. Capability. Capability, yeah. Thanks for joining us on this quest called Constant Wonder. I'm Marcus Smith, visiting in this episode with Dr. Sasha Reed, a biogeochemist with the U.S. Geological Survey. We've had a chance to get to know some of what makes her tick and the backstory of how she came out west to discover a passion, a passion that has transformed her life experience, and it all connects with a natural phenomenon called biological soil crusts, or biocrust. She came to the desert later than some of us do. I'm a Westerner with family roots that have grown uh, as deep as roots can in the dry lands of the arid Intermountain West. She came West, discovered how much she could love it here, and in the process also discovered an entire subfield of biogeochemistry. It spoke not only to her academic skills, but I think to her natural inclinations. And in that subfield, she became an expert on these fragile colonies of living microorganisms that hold vulnerable desert soil in place and perform a host of other ecosystem services, as they're called. We're going to hear about those shortly. A little earlier, she shared with us a description of her first foray far afield, all alone in desert backcountry to collect specimens. And she's described what a moment can feel like when you first fall in love with some new, beautiful personal discovery of a natural phenomenon that you've never seen before. My first encounter with BioCrust was less of a clear-cut moment of recognition. I had to have somebody point the stuff out to me. It looked a little bit like burnt soil. You have to get down on your knees and kind of lean in to see anything resembling life there. You can't hear them, of course. And yes, once again, I'm thinking about Horton the Elephant, his attentiveness, his care for what really is there after all. And you have one of those moments of, well, who'd have thunk? So what exactly were those impressive multicolored specimens that she collected and toted back to a lab in her backpack that day? Uh, little doodads that are alive. Yeah. Little doodads that are alive and that just like plants are photosynthesizers. So they're getting their energy from the sun and from carbon dioxide and water, um, making their own food. And so just like plants, they are able to exist in places that 
don't have much else going on, and they actually thrive there because these biocrusts want to be able to have direct access to the lots of sun. And so they don't we don't find them in closed canopy forests where there's lots of trees overhead, but instead in places like drylands or the Arctic, Antarctica, where they don't have to compete for sun with those plants that are taller. And, and so they're, they're making this living in a really hard environment and they're able, I think one of the things that I really like about biocrusts is that they're optimists, I think. <laughs> How do you know that? And so <laughs> they, they really go for it. They, they do everything they can in the relatively short time they're allowed to do stuff. And what I mean by that is, they are they're, so they're a crazy word called poikilohydric, which means that they are active when they're wet and they're inactive when they're dry. Pausing here for just a second for the fun of savoring this crazy new word. Put it in your back pocket for a game of Scrabble. Uh, the word she just used to describe a particular property of biocrust is poikilohydric, P O I K I L O. Hydric, H-Y-D-R-I-C. Now, this isn't verbatim what you'll find in a dictionary, but I'm going to say that poikilohydric basically means stop whatever you're doing when you're dry and kick into high gear when you're wet because you're not a cactus and you can't store water and you can't even pretend to run on fumes. So unlike plants, you can imagine the roots and they have access to water and a plant can make decisions about opening and closing its stomates, the pores that it has, which take in CO2 and release water. Biocrust don't make those decisions. If they are wet, they go for it. They hope that it's going to be worth it every single time um, because sometimes it's not worth it. Sometimes being active puts you at risk. And so they don't worry about the risk. They move forward. They just, they just do this. They just do do that thing. Do their do that <laughs> thing. They they say you know life's hard, but you got to enjoy the moments when it's not. So I learned a long time ago, and this was a surprise to me, that even though we use the term dormant during the winter months in a kind of a climate where it's snowy and cold, there are still active cells. They just slow down. Mm -hmm. With these biocrusts, do they just slow down or do they become almost fully inert? So great question. When they're dry, they really do become inert. And there can be things that change in them that, you know, they're experiencing a lot of ultraviolet radiation from the sun. So some chemistry can happen without their control, but they really do become inert. But they don't become inert just because it's cold. Or if you think about plants and, and kind of the winter being a slow low time, a lot of that has to do with what we call phenology, which is really just the timing of activity of living things. So if you think about a, an oak tree, it, it's going to grow leaves in the spring, have those leaves through the summer, then it will shed those leaves and will be dormant through the winter. And just like you're saying, we're learning that they're not inactive during that time. They're just doing a lot less than they do, let's say, in the spring. But biocrusts don't have that sort of seasonal phenology in the same way because they're going to do something if they're wet and they're not going to if they're dry. So what we see in our studies on the Colorado Plateau near Moab, Utah, biocrusts are hugely active in the winter. And they can even photosynthesize under a layer of snow. It's called subnivian photosynthesis. But because if you think about that interface where the snow meets the soil, over the course of a day-night cycle, often it will melt. You'll have liquid water at that interface, even though there's frozen snow on top. And that's just enough to, to get going. just enough. And they are happy as clams, but they can go for it. They don't care what time of year it is. They just care about whether they're wet or not. You kind of admire these things. I do. I really is admire Is that weird bio, to be an admirer? Probably. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is not a put on. You really think about these processes. Definitely. As 
phenomena that are phenomenal. I definitely do. They are phenomenal. These ancient organisms that are able to make a living where other kinds of organisms can't, to create a habitat that is part of the larger ecosystem, I really do admire them. Yeah. Now, one of the exciting things, and and I'm going to betray myself here, that I get excited about some things that I might not be able to get my neighbors, you know, <laughs> instantaneously interested in. But let's talk about sunburn mm-hmm. on and the ultraviolet radiation that you mentioned. There are components of bio crust that have to hang out with other components, but they have different functions and they interact with each other. And some of them are like hiding behind the others so they don't get burned. Yeah. Is this a system? Is this, sometimes people throw out the symbiotic as a term, you know, neighbor helping neighbor kind of a thing. Within the bio crust itself, how, are, how, how is the help being passed around? Our understanding of how bio crust organisms interact with one another is not very good. And so I, I will tell you the things that I think we know, but there's so much to be learned about how these organisms behave as a community and about how they exchange resources, how they facilitate each other, how they compete with each other. Just kind of like a city asking. almost with its own little economy going absolutely, on there. Absolutely. It absolutely is a city and it's functioning and different parts look different than other parts and, and the way that those parts connect or don't connect with each other is still unknown. And so we know that biocrusts seem to assemble their communities, and we really do always think of them as a community, not a single species. Even if you took a small one-inch little plug of biocrust, you would have lots of different kinds of organisms. They could be dominated by one kind of lichen or one kind of moss, but it's always a community of organisms. Uh, okay, I'm thinking of a coral reef. Is that yes. unfair oh, of me? No, that's the the perfect analogy. It's the coral reef of the desert. It's If you picture a coral reef and shrink it in size, that's what biocrusts look like. The colors, the different organisms living side by side, uh, the different shapes, you know, the stag coral or the brain coral. Biocrusts look a lot like those different shapes. And just like coral, Biocrusts are an interaction among multiple types of organisms. And as you said, our understanding of symbiosis and mutualism is, are shifting. And whether or not things are kind of co benefiting as best friends versus one is able to enslave the other for its needs versus they kind of just like being near each other. And, and we're not exactly sure why. That's still being discovered. But we definitely see them growing as intact, high functioning communities that are doing things like shading, as you say, protecting different organisms live beneath to be able to avoid that ultraviolet radiation. More highly pigmented organisms can live above. To give an example of of how we're thinking about this is we are working on biocrust restoration in a lot of settings. How can we bring biocrusts back after disturbance? Yeah, that's not unlike the bleached coral reefs and people try to figure out how to... Exactly right. And so for a long time, our studies of biocrust restoration really focused on breaking up, kind of crumbling up biocrusts and sprinkling them out across the landscape that was disturbed. So if you you take an intact community and you crumble it up, you sprinkle it out in the community that needs to be built. But what we were taking advantage of was the fact that you can break biocrust into small pieces and they survive, which is pretty cool. Um, And so we were doing that so that we could cover these larger areas. But what we're realizing now is we are eliminating the power of the community when we do that. And so when we were sprinkling them out, we were consistently surprised at how little success we had in restoring the biocrust communities. We're really good at growing them in the laboratory, in the greenhouse. Oh my gosh, yes, we can grow all of these beautiful lichens, amazing mosses. Let's sprinkle them out onto the landscape and, and save the desert. It kind of makes you wonder how they ever survived in the first place because if there's a critical mass required and the mass needs to be these little neighbors who are closely adjacent and there's a tipping point where it can, you could say it's now flourishing, it just makes you scratch your head and think about 
the odds against it ever happening in the first place. Definitely, and how successful they've been with those odds. When you think about if if we were to allow a patch of land that was disturbed to come back on its own, really give it time and the climate was right, we would see that there is a predictable order in the organisms that come back that we will often call that succession. Was, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so the first come these very lightly pigmented cyanobacteria, often of the microcoleus genus. And and I picture them like little green, light green worms. And they are they're unicellular organisms, but they live together in this worm-like shape. And then the outer skin of the worm is you and I have talked about before, the exopolis polysaccharide sticky sheath that's amazing at holding soil together, which is why biocrusts are so critical. The for They're the glue. They're the glue. And those organisms will worm their way in first, and they don't have to have a lot of pigmentation from the sun because they can wiggle down and have the soil be Protect their sunscreen. Them. Have you seen these things under microscopes? Oh, yeah. Under microscope and scanning electron microscopes, so seeing them really close, seeing them bound to that mineral soil. Can you watch them wiggle? You can watch them wiggle. You can watch in a place where they're really abundant. If you wet the soil, you can see the soil turn light green as they wiggle to the top. When it's just rained, maybe. When it's just rained. Yeah. Exactly. Up and down, up and down, depending on the rain. Up and down, stabilizing the soil. And so then we see things like mosses and then lichens moving in because they don't have mobility. So they need that soil to be stabilized first. And then we see them assembling. And because the diversity is so high and because the field of biocrust science is so young, we don't know for sure. But it seems like certain types of biocrusts like to live next to other types of biocrusts. If a tree falls in a forest, some folks still like to ask, and no one is around to hear it, does it make a sound? Well, here's a corollary for you, and by the way, it's also a pretty human-centric sort of question. If a tourist steps on some biocrust, is the world really all that much worse off? Will that impact reverberate anywhere? A really blunt way to put the question goes like this. What has biocrust ever really done for me? Dr. Sasha Reed has fielded this sort of question on many occasions, and not just coming from me playing the role of devil's advocate. So cyanobacteria, they need to get a toehold before the lichens and the mosses can move in and even have a chance. This is that principle of succession you've reminded us about. And then I've heard about ecosystem services, and I kind of want to put humans into this configuration, you know, to get the full context, looking up the, the food chain. Um, where do I come in if I'm 200 miles away from Moab or more and the lichen and the moss, they're getting their piece of the pie and the cyanobacteria, they're thriving. What's in this down the road for Marcus Smith that I should really care? I do care, of course. Oh, yeah. You got to care, Marcus. Here we go. So one of the main ecosystem services that Biocrest provide is soil stabilization, that glue. And so they are reducing dust formation and reducing erosion. Dust is a huge issue for the Southwest. It has human health consequences because of diseases that are carried in dust. And it's also a big deadly issue with automobile accidents and dust. And then economic things like planes have to be rerouted from Phoenix when dust storms move through. You might still be thinking, why should I care? I'm not going to fly to Phoenix anytime soon. But the transport of that dust to other places can really affect all of us. So as an example, when dust blows from the Colorado Plateau to the Rocky Mountains, it changes the energy balance, the color of the snow that it lands on. That in turn affects how the snow melts because it's darker, so it melts faster. And that decouples in time when that snow melt becomes available for living things that rely on it. You scientists are always connecting dots. Yeah. And there's a concatenation of events. So that could be frightening to think that the dust affects the snow melt, affects the water cycle mm-hmm. because climate change. Mm-hmm. That could be frightening. 
And, and it affects, I mean, what the study has suggested that looked at that is that it reduces the water availability in the Colorado River Basin by 5%. That's a lot. That affects all of us who rely on that water in the Colorado River Basin, which is already a pretty limited resource being battled over. I pushed the conversation there a little in the direction of land management policy by asking what BioCrust is doing for me or you or anybody else. The truth is, I can personally attest what she's saying about snow and dust. Having lived for several decades in the West in high desert country, we have had significant changes in the dry lands of the West. It's true that these storms have increased noticeably. And even where there are no BioCrusts, like under... What used to be the Great Salt Lake, you know, the rapidly disappearing Great Salt Lake, there's a big story of increasing dust coming out of that neck of the woods, too. So, I, yeah, I do care a whole lot. And it appears that biocrusts contribute to our well being in ways that seem disproportionate to their minuscule size, their all too negligible microscopic size. Well, you know, all of this leads to discussions that people are having about policy issues and what are we going to do and what are our laws going to be. Hopefully, good science would inform our decisions as a society. There's also something just joyful Mm. about figuring it out, that chain I'm talking about. Definitely. Is there something that you've landed on before? And I don't know that you have to be the first to have discovered it, but when that flip switches, Mm -hmm. and suddenly you see the cause and effect or the relationship going on within the biocrust or between biocrust and the neighbors of Mm biocrust. The bigger picture that you didn't ask that I'll speak to first is I think that moment when you figure something out is the moment that drives all scientists to be scientists. And all of us can remember times when we we're trying to figure something out and all of a sudden we do and our brain floods with good chemicals. We, That's wordle for it's, me, Exactly. Right? <laughs> because you're like, yes, I got it. I think, I think science is our species evolutionary advantage. We all use science to solve problems, to make decisions, to figure things out. And I think part of it is the absolute joy that we experience when we solve a problem or figure out a riddle or something like that. But yes, I I have those experiences where I'm trying to figure something out or where something reveals itself to me in an unexpected way and it blows my mind. And the joy of it is an electric current running through my body. Did you get one of those yesterday, a week ago, a month ago, a year ago? I'd say the last time that I got one was probably a couple weeks ago. So we set up a new experiment in Casa Grande Ruins National Monument. And we set up this system, high tech, and if you can picture putting a clear chamber over top of a soil that has bio crust in it and being able to have a robot arm that moves that chamber onto and off of the bio crust for a few minutes every hour of every day for a year. And that chamber is measuring how much photosynthesis and respiration the bio crust is having and the and the soil microbes too with the atmosphere. So we're asking questions about what role does bio crust play in the global carbon cycle and how is that role regulated by it rained, how warm is it? And then we have a drought experiment and a, a physical disturbance experiment. Those data of seeing the effect of the physical disturbance, seeing the effect of drought, seeing the unbelievable amount of carbon dioxide that these little bio crusts are pulling out of the atmosphere for their photosynthesis. I was speechless. I felt such joy and excitement that we were able to look at the activity of these organisms and the contributions that they make. And it was... This moment in time when time stopped and you're just in the data, you're just thinking about how this world works, what those data mean, how you might be able to add new data to them to better understand how you can share this with the other people that you share Earth with. Just really, really powerful. 
How much carbon can BioCrest <laughs> pull down? So what we'll ref- we need the full year to be able to figure it out. And it's a little bit complicated because they are a community that includes the non-photosynthetic members. So, so we have to put all that into our accounting of the carbon. But from what we can see, BioCrusts are able to take as much carbon dioxide from the atmosphere as a leaf of that same size could. But I think of the biocrust as a relatively thin skin on the surface, and I think of a plant as being able to pull that carbon and shove it down deeper into the ground. Absolutely. And so you're, what you're getting at is one of my personal favorite questions that we're trying to use isotopes to answer. But what's the fate of that carbon. Yeah, that where does they it go? In. Where does it go? How long does it stay where? Who eats it? How deep does it go? And so that's a big part of what we're trying to Because it's one thing ask. to rent the carbon. It's another thing to buy it to own it. Absolutely. And from a climate perspective, we need to know who's buying it. Renting or buying, that was just my way of trying to imagine how successfully biocrusts can hang on to carbon from the atmosphere. How permanent is this? Well, Sasha Reed clearly relishes the data, but she's also quick to say that it's not all in yet. Nevertheless, she maintains that biocrusts may be a major player in the carbon cycle. And to underscore her point, she gave me an estimate that really surprised me. The understanding that we do have suggests that biocrusts cover 12% of Earth's land surface. No. It's like twice as much as tropical rainforests. It's extensive. No. <laughs> yeah. Is this all dry land? It's all places where plants have trouble forming intact canopies. So Arctic, Antarctica, um, lots of drylands. And drylands are thought to cover well over 40% of Earth's land surface. So they're a big component in and of themselves. And so biocrusts will fill these niches where plants aren't shading them out. And it's a lot of area. So even if at, at the individual scale, it's not a huge number, you need to multiply it by a huge number and then see what you get. This is what we want to know. I know that you've been a guide to lots of newcomers, total newcomers who've never seen this before. You get to introduce them to biocrust formations for their very first time. One of the, the great perks of my career is getting to witness that quite a bit, where you take someone and you see that change in their facial expression and the light of their eye as they get down and they start to see biocrusts for the first time. When I think of biocrusts, I think part of what comes to mind is their importance in ecosystem function we were talking about earlier. But I think what sparked my original passion for them and what I see people as they have that moment with biocrusts is just that they're so cool. They look (laughs) so cool. You kind of have to work for it at first to get down there close enough. And then you just imagine these small organisms really making it on the surface of this desert soil, their color and their shapes and the way that they're jumbled together and how they just seem like aliens from another planet. We don't expect to find something fantastic there on some dirt on the ground. And so the surprise of it is part of what triggers the emotional response. We do something a lot um, when we're showing people crust for the first time where we'll wet up a moss, we'll add water, and the moss will physically move as it opens itself to the sun and unfurls its little leaves for photosynthesis and seeing in this kind of vast open landscape this bright green patch of moving tissue is just really, really cool. You know the time-lapse photography, those Mm -hmm. things that are so famous with the mushrooms, you know, the fungus? Do they make those for biocrusts? There are some really cool moss videos the lab that produced them. It's it's in Salt Lake City, I'm pretty sure. If you can picture 
a tiny moss and its little leaves, those leaves have a little kind of spike at the end called an awn. And it's like a little hair that sticks out from the tip of the leaf. These videos show how those awns are used by the mosses to get water from the air to precipitate onto its the on and then it funnels down into the moss so it's harvesting water from the air and then opening up when i was a kid going to school we talked about kingdoms mm-hmm. and for some reason i stopped at plants and animals you know <laughs> and then as a grown up i started thinking oh fungus is kind of a different category mm-hmm. biocrusts are we talking to like is it you can't call it a new kingdom. What, what I mean, but I think in the school system for kids, it would be really cool if they had a new category that they could elevate to the stature of maybe plants, animals, I fungus. I love that idea. Biocrusts. Yeah, I think it would be fantastic to have its own grouping. And biocrusts are really hard to categorize in the absence of that kind of grouping because they span so widely across the tree of life. So you have mosses, which are plants. They are actually plants. They're not vascular plants. They're not grasses and shrubs and trees, but they're plants. Then you have lichens that are a mutualism, maybe a a symbiosis between a fungi and algae of some sort, cyanobacteria. And those two organisms are more different on the tree of life than we are from the fungi. So those two things that are living together, look like a single organism, are more phylogenetically different than we are from the fungal part of that organism. I mean, that's amazing. And then the cyanobacteria are this whole other group. And so they are such a diverse range across that tree of life that it would be a lot easier and more cohesive if we could see them as their own group. Yeah. Have you found that children resonate with any of this? Yeah. I mean, from my my nieces and my nephew, they love biocrust. They are just (laughs) so cool. And part of it is doing the things like wetting up the crust, getting to see something that looked like it wasn't alive, turn alive. Part of it is they're already closer to the ground. (laughs) So it's easy on their their high functioning knees to to get down and see the biocrust. But they really like hearing that little things matter. And so I think biocrusts, often we we assume that they're probably not that important because they're tiny, but they are really important. And for kids who sometimes we assume they don't know as much as they do or they don't have the role to play that they do, they re- resonates with them. Little things are important and kids kids can feel that. I launched into this episode with a quote from Wallace Stegner, a famed interpreter of the American West, a quote about the inhuman scale of our unfathomably large deserts. But if I'm going to be on the level here, I should say that Stegner was also perfectly aware of the critical value of the minuscule and what we overlook when we get too hung up on monumental imposing stuff. I'm thinking of Stegner's beautiful book from 1967 titled All the Little Live Things. Pour a little water on dry biocrust sometime and see what happens. Our sincere thanks to Dr. Sasha Reed for spending time with us. She's a biogeochemist and ecologist with the U.S. Geological Survey in Moab, Utah. Her experience is hardly limited to expertise with biocrust. And if you want any proof, you should check out her photo on her USGS webpage where she is holding a three-toed sloth, which tells me that biological soil crusts aren't the only slow living thing that she's paid attention to. Thanks to Eric Scholzka and Audrey Hughes for production of this episode. Sound design for this episode by Kevin West, Kira Brewer, and Kaysen Renshaw. I'm Marcus Smith. Thanks for listening. Constant Wonder is a production of BYU Radio.